This seemed like another botched week. Not because the episodes were particularly bad, but because the shows really weren't living up to their potential. Uh, let's start off with that with Zuoger. And, um, yeah, everybody got wrecked from Gift last week, and they're working to recover from that. And Birdman, um, kind of rescues Yamato from the debris, sort of. He kind of fell unconscious and took uh, Yamato back to his home, showing that there is a level com of compassion from this entity that the others have just um, ridden off as just a thief. And we kind of get some initial um, elaboration slash exposition on him in that the reason he's taken the champion symbol, King's Key, whatever they're calling it, um, because he doesn't want to be on in the zoo land. He wants to stay on Earth for ver reasons that aren't specified. He actually hates his homeland and finds it pretty rotten. Again, not exactly getting into why. I think it might be because in the past he found this world and, um fell in love with it kind of how Larry has, except um, instead of seeing the diversity and humanity that Larry does, he sees this world doing things so much better than his own or something. I'm just speculating here. But, you know, he doesn't seem like an entirely awful person from the little bit we get with um, him interacting with Yamato, even though... Yamato was pretty much unconscious, and the, the, what we see from him interacting with the other humans. Um, when they all recover from their injuries and get back to the home, um, Yamato re really doesn't want to talk to them about um, the Birdman saving them because he's afraid they'll leave, and you know, that he hasn't really bought ever bought into the th the parts that the Birdman is a bad person since he helped him as a child and all that, you know, initial imp impressions and all that. And with the Earth in um, its current state of being attacked by the Death Galeons, um, he doesn't want the others to leave as that'll just leave him alone with this um, duty to fight. This is, of course, excluding the fact that there are other Sentai on the planet, but you know, these shows are standalone outside of the crossover so that, you know, you don't usually apply that logic to this, those situations. It kind of cheapens the experience. But, um, this is probably the first time Mario has, Mario is, um, Yamato's uncle, has actually done anything that mattered to the show in that when he describes the situation in, uh, Va uh, vague terms, um, kind of in com just general conversation with uh, Mario, so the entire thing doesn't seem forced. It's just that um, he ends up contrasting his life, as in Mario's life, as an artist, to um, Yamato's uh, budding career as a scientist, in that um, artists are allowed to feel to find the truth, whereas good scientists cannot have their own biases affect the truths of situations or studies they find. So, like, say, if a artist wants to paint, for example, a statue of a bird red, which is the example that is um, playing off of this because Mario has painted a bird uh, specifically an eagle with red and other multicolored wings on it, so it's, you know, it's like a, it makes it stand out even if it's not realistic, and hey, that's paralleling the fact that Yamato is the red Zuo Eagle. Um, but it's also informing him that he can't let his own biases and expectations of him thinking of the Birdman as a good person just because of his past interaction um, conflict with the truth of what they know of the person. Um, and that he did steal the champion symbols, he did trap the other Zoomans here, and that is inflicting yourself on another. So even if that might have a good reason behind it, um, 
that doesn't take away from what they did. And since, you know, they're other humans, they're the ones that had this afflicted upon them, there's, there's a certain weight to their actions. And it also um, convinces him that um, despite him wanting them to stay, he can't force himself to... Uh, sorry, he can't um, force them to stay through not leading them to the Birdman. That's um, dishonest. That's going against, you know, their whole dynamic. He... When I saw this scene, I kept thinking of one of the things that really pissed me off about the ending of Tokyuger, as in not the specific ending, but as they were going into the ending arc, where um, most of the Tokyuger were going to uh, fight with ya with um, Wright, who was being corrupted by the Shadow Line into Shadow Tokyo Ichigo, and how, you know, they were going to stay with them even if it cost them, you know, the ability to return to being kids, because it was their right to choose that, and Wright effectively robbed them of their choice, their right, by inflicting his own um, decisions upon them and tricked them into being returned to children at the exact wrong time, as that is when um, the Shadow Line attacked, and were it not for plot contrivances, he would have gotten them all killed. You know, this is the... and it's never recognized as being that. Raz, this is the reverse. Yamato um, is convinced to let them do what they feel like because it would be wrong to inflict what he wants onto them. So he tells them about the Birdman and the whole um, thing that happens during this thing, during these events, so that, yeah, they can go and try and get the champion symbol and he'll let them know if Gift reactivates so they can fight together. Only he has no intention of letting them know when Gift reactivates because, you know, if it's if they really want to turn, return home, if that's what they really want, he can't stop them. You know, it's, it's really mature to let them... Honestly, Digimon Try did something similar with, um... Um... Joe in its second, um, in its second part where, um, Ty has to accept that if Joe doesn't want to be with them, fight with them because he has other priorities, then that's his decision to make. They can't force him, uh, into that, into the whole thing as then his heart wouldn't be in it. And as shown previously in the franchise, that's when bad things happen. Um, so yeah, he... Since he doesn't believe he can depend on them to be back after, um, they go, after they retrieve the champion symbol, he just goes to fight it alone when Gift reactivates, and the others are busy with the Birdman. And, yeah, I like that they're going against one of the things that really pissed me off about Tokyuger. There are a lot of things that pissed me off about Tokyuger, you all know this by this point. Um, because, you know, it's showing how it really should work with a compassionate individual, uh, with someone that is worthy of respect and is a mature leader in, um, you know, you can't just inspire people, you have to do what's best for others, even if it's not the best for yourself. Um, and, you know, trust in them to do what they feel is right. And as they fight the Birdman, who is really freaking strong, um, they're about to get the champion symbol back, and they it just happens to fall in such a way that they see that Gift is reactivated and is attacking the city, and Yamato is fighting alone. And they realize what their obsession almost did, and if they went to back home with the champion symbol right after this, what they would leave the planet for, and they decide to stay. Now, the thing that I feel is botched about this is they go straight to the fight, as in go straight uh, from their fight with the Birdman to backing up Yamato, and from how it is staged, 
the champion symbol, if they were to were if they were going to just rush from this battle to there, it's right in their path. Like you don't even really need to divert that far to get it. So pick it up, run away from the Birdman while he's injured and can't get up, and get to Yamato. You have the champion symbol right with you when you choose to go back, and you don't have to go and find this... I'm going to say it because it's expected because it's Kohei Murakami. This asshole again. You have achieved your object... You have achieved your objective and can just, you know, wait it out until the seer... Until this threat is gone to go back home. So it's like, you got your first arc objective. Now what? Well, maybe, you know, more character developmental episodes or something about them learning to better appreciate the human world without this, um, uh, hanging over them like a Damocles sword. Maybe, um, make the Birdman into a pseudo-antagonist. I mean, it is Kohei Murakami about him trying to steal back this last, uh, champion symbol so they can't, um actually go home for whatever reason that he hates the Zooland. I mean, I'm really curious on um, why he's like this, but it, I would feel would result in some better character drama for him to be an enemy not of actual malice, but out of um, his own motivations and regrets and whatever it is that has turned him against his own home. So yeah, that's what I feel they botched here, in that it's an easy way to move the show into its next stage, especially since we know that Champion Symbol is going to be turned into the transformation artifact of whoever becomes Duo Zawald. And, you know, it's... Honestly, the Zuo of the World thing is the only reason I could see them not taking it. But with how it's framed, it's like... You know, they could have not had it be, in a way, they could have, um, say, um, instead of it being right in their path, maybe it rolled over a cliff and fell into a river so that it would take, it would require mo something more elaborate than just picking it up to recover it in the midst of this battle, so... The Birdman could still recover it while they're busy, because he would have that time they wouldn't have, and that would lead into a more, um, cohesive, um, diversion against, yeah, just, what I keep saying, just pick it up. Wouldn't that changed much, aside from, you know, where you shot the battle, since there ha we've already been shown, um, in previous... Uh, scenes that there are areas they've been shooting at regularly which have that kind of environment where they where it would be lost temporarily if until they put in the effort to recover it that that would make sense to me um, well since they go to to help Yamato they um, apparently have this um, strength of camaraderie now that um, some of their esoteric on-the-ground tactics can now, I don't want to say defeat Gift, because they really don't, but it seems like they're doing better now for no tangible reason. And, and even on, you know, just on the small scale against it to get a, um, leeway against it, because the, most of the fights, um, with Yamato against Gift... It's with just him transformed into his Sentai form and not any of the mech stuff, which... Why didn't he use the mech stuff? I mean, yeah, he would have only had Gorilla and Eagle, but it would have made more sense than attacking it... Well, pretty much going Carter Grayson on it. And this is a pretty powerful mon uh, machine here that kicked their asses with ease before, so it wouldn't make sense for him to do that aside from... Okay, I could see the agility and attacks angle, but he could do that with in his mech still and have that work. But yeah, their newfound camaraderie allows them to combine all of the mechs, all of their um, cube animals into Wild Zuo King, and 
Seeing it in action, it looks a lot better than the toy does. My issue with the toy is that the um, way they configure the fists is that so they're hanging off like, um, you know, pretty much like this. You got the giant uh, elbow, giant shoulder pads with just the arm hanging off from the end, whereas I feel it would make more sense for it to, like, have them be giant shoulder pads like, I don't know, a Gundam has. Um, just, you know, giant blocks, so it kind of looks like gigantic, um, is it biceps or triceps? Um, but it, um, uh, pretty much so that, you know, it has an inner hinge, and I've asked people who have gotten the toys, and they can't reconfigure the, um, toy limbs to have that happen, sadly, and, eh, design flaw on the part of band of, of uh, Bandai's toy division there. But yeah, it looks much better as an actual mech. But I feel they again botched it here as they have, they pretty much form the mech, have Gift attack them a few times, and then go for the finishing move. And that's not really showing off your new combination mecha if it's not really getting any time to really you know, showcase the grandeur of the f of the combination. It's kind of defeating its own purpose. Hell, the, um... Zuo King, thus far, has had the best introduction with, um... It's, co it's, um... It's combinations. It's had the longest fights. It's had the most elaborate one. And, yeah, the, the first mech introduction usually has the best one. But it's not too entire exclusion it part of the thing that helps like both in both in the toy sale sense and in the um this is a powerful met uh, this is a powerful addition to their arsenal is how you sell it in its initial introduction and this was a big problem with ninja and to a lesser extent tokyuger in that when they introduced these mechs and new combinations they really didn't do much with them in their introductory episodes, so they seemed lamer than they were. Like, I really like um, Wild Zio King's look. I legitimately do, but it's not that interesting. It's not that um, appealing because, you know, they didn't give it any time to really make it appealing. Like, they didn't show how the um, mole and giraffe... Um, leg equipment could be used uh, as well by the mech by just, you know, t picking it up and using it in one of the arms, and okay, maybe they're waiting until they get the next armament piece to really do that, since, hey, that's probably um, partly where the suit actor's leg is, so maybe it's a more um, needed part of the suit or something, but, you know, they could have Drawn out the fight a bit. I mean, you, you keep drawing out the fights on the ground, and just, um... It didn't exactly make it appealing. I feel that they spent more time in a, the effects budget with Yamato fighting Gift, but that kind of felt unnecessary, because, you know, it's like... It's a human-sized... Sentai fighting a giant monster. You pretty much know how this is going to go. So, you we're just waiting for the mecha fight, and then the mecha fight is so unappealing. I hate to keep going back to that, but yeah, that's what it was. But yeah, with since they gave up their chance to get the champion symbol, stupidly, the Zoomens are in for the long haul, and they're going to help out Pretty much the same thing as what I said before. They're going to help out until the crisis is over, and then they're going to get the champion symbol back from the Birdman. Um, I'm glad that he's going to be recurring more past this. I'm I'm really... Why I don't think it's a bad episode is there is enough story threads remaining from this event to keep me watching, keep me intrigued, which the show should be go should be doing. Just that the minutia of its events irritate me. Much as they do did ghost this week, as we had three no no count them four fight scenes this time, which 
pretty much cut out any real meaningful um, chance to really um, contrast or see the consequences of the fallout from the last one, and this is becoming the recurring problem with Ghost in that it doesn't give any of these things their time to really... Um, how should I phrase this? Develop. It's like, it's putting the story um, points in there, but not really addressing them. I think I've said that before in this case, because um, Aaron spends half the episode completely... No, not completely. Effectively catatonic as Takara tries to get him away from the fire gun miser, which is, um... Yeah, ridiculously powerful. And he's just, um... It's not until Adele, you know, confronts all of the riders with the gun miser near the end of the episode that he... that he finally breaks down and realizes the utopia... the utopia... Uh, that the gun world had is anything but. But it doesn't feel very natural to the setting, even with um, Makoto trying to um, first... I'm again blanking on the word I want to use. I don't want to... I, I think I'm, I'm going to go with comfort him on his loss, and then, you know, kind of kicks his ass when he kind of starts going, oh, woe is me, but... You know, neither is really justified because they put it in the terms of, I have no heart. And, yeah, we've kind of accepted that you do, because you're just ignoring that you do have one, because heart don't work like that. I think they would have worked better had they um, kind of gone in the compassion route, but they didn't really do that. And it's pretty much just... Um, uh, it's meant to show how Auron is a rejecting um, the Gamma world that uh, Dell is trying to propagate that is so corrupted and Adele is completely blind to it. I don't see why he is, but hey, you gotta make your monster somehow. And it, it, the problem really is the fight scenes. And it's like, don't get me wrong, they're well shot, but... They're crowding out everything else with how many there are in... It's like, okay, Gaim had multiple fights in an episode, but they were usually short and accented the story. I feel that's really where we started getting this problem in with, with Kamen Rider was with Gaim, because... People have problems with Wizard. I don't find a lot of them legitimate, but one of them I can agree is, is that Haruto pretty much wrecks everybody's shit. And... There doesn't seem to be much of a challenge for him past his acquisition of the dragon forms without it kind of being ridiculous in it. But at least the story structure worked for the show. It's like it developed things across the arc, but its overarching story was pretty weak. I can accept, I can accept those ele elements of why people would think Wizard is kind of the weak points in the post-Decade series. And... Ghost is probably starting to supersede people on that because it's not really tangibly developing things. It's, it's more in the afterthought kind of sense. Because more is spent, more time in this episode is spent with um, the painter Ganma reencountering a new version of the musician Ganma who is trying and failing to create a musical accentation for when um, Igor re uh, finalizes the um, Demia project, which is still an ongoing subplot. But the problem with that in its entirety is, why would Igor care about music? He's like, music is one of those things that's all driven by emotion and taste and appeal, and those are things they said the Gamma world doesn't have, so why would they find any appeal in having this as part of their presentation? Um, so it's this is like, it's in the same vein as why Igor thought the painter Gamma was useless, 
and yet that he created another one for this task that because he doesn't get music um it makes no sense to do granted it's another example um this musician gamma i know it's based off classical musician it's na his name escapes me at the moment i apologize um is pretty much just recreating that historical figure's um, musical pieces. So it's classical music, and classical music, even if you don't really, you know, listen to it all the time, you kind of get a developmental appreciation of, because, um, you know, it's not horrible, it's just not... What's the phrase I want to use? It's not as fast-paced, but um, there's nothing structurally wrong with it. Where was I going with this? So yeah, the only thing it does, it really does is showcase, again, how the, um, the, um, garbed Ganma are evolving with the extended exposure to these entities that it, they've mistaken as defective when yeah, you created them that way. Um, but its only real point serves as to get the painter Ganma out of the picture after... You know, you could have done that a while ago. And I mean that, you could have done that a while ago and just have him shoved off screen after you rendered him benign. Like, say, um, when you got Aron as part of the regular cast after... His gamma form was destroyed, like, right, right before they got grateful. Yeah, that would have worked. But now, now he's gone, and you spent most of the episode, you should have been focusing on uh, getting Adele to officially switch sides on a character that didn't really matter. I mean, the best we get out of it is the, compa the compassion that... Anari showed to Javert, um, paying off in how he helped defend the non-combatants, since all the common Riders are in the gun world right now, uh, against Igor coming to attack them because of the musician Gamma. Again, I'm forgetting the, the specific historical figure's name. Uh, is collaborating, is suddenly collaborating and being friends with the painter Gamma, because they're both in a creative slump. Which is what precipitates them leaving to kind of get out of that slump by going somewhere else, off screen. To hopefully not matter again in the rest of the series. Yeah. And I guess it, it would have also been better to focus on what was set up last episode in that um, Makoto, in his human form again, finally, is um, now in possession of the Deep Spectre icon, which comes into play at the end of the episode. Except we don't really know anything about the Deep Spectre icon, just that it's very powerful and it's more or less designed to counter the gun misers. But we don't know anything about it, how it was created, how it has this power to do that, and why it can fight the gun misers when the gun misers can paralyze Grateful and pretty much render Takeru um, useless against them in that form. Because that's, that's literally what they do to show to allow um, Deep Spectre the chance to pretty much have the solo battle. Um, Necrom is rendered um, KO'd while... Well, not exactly KO'd, but unable to fight, and... Uh, Takara once transforming into Grateful, which makes sense to fight off a very powerful enemy, is just suddenly unable to fight. And it doesn't make sense because the last time the Gun Miser's power was seen when he when they turned um, the Ganma Ultima Ganma into the Ga the Fire Ultima Ganma, in, like when Grateful premiered, it's like Grateful completely wrecked their shit, and it's like, why are you doing this suddenly when all of these other uses of Grateful have been against enemies that don't even challenge its power? Like, why don't you actually step up 
and have these entities start appearing before this if you were going to bring out Grateful for this showcasing. Because it's not really showcase. It's like what was done with the Mex and uh, Zuoger. You're not really showing this great power that well if it's against common enemies when it's been shown to be so strong against these higher tiered ones that have been just become afterthoughts, despite wrecking all of the others completely. It's like, you're creating these tiers of power and yet not keeping them consistent in between each other just to um, showcase the new toy of the week. It's very... It's coming back to that again. It's unappealing. But yeah, Deep Spectre. I got some issues with the color tones, but otherwise not not much. It's like, it's even more demonic than, um, than the, where was I going with this? It, it feels like a natural enhancement off of Tokon Boost, which, you know, makes sense. It's um, Makoto's equivalent to Tokon Boost. Even to the point of uh, wielding a recolored version of the, sunglass, of the Sunglass Slasher, which, yeah, that's ridiculously lazy for Bondi, and I don't know why they did that. Well, I know why they didn't have... They decided not to make a new toy entirely new mold. They just recolored it. But I, um... Seems like kind of a waste to not give him a, another unique weapon. Maybe they're saving it for when Mugen Damashi gets um, revealed in a bit. And honestly, the Mugen thing is the re only real justification I can see for Grateful not being effective against the Gun Misers, in that the Gun Misers are united in their cause, so all 15 of them are... Um, supporting the others, while Takeru is still working to bring the 15 heroic icon spirits together, so Grateful isn't as strong as it should be. As said last episode with um, the minister that's creating all of this um, ghost icon tech. Um, so, you know, that would be a narrative explanation for this, but it doesn't quite work since, you know, he fought um, a gun miser powered Ganma before this, and won easily. It it's just it does it doesn't work for me. Garo is running into what I thought was going to be a problem with the uh, side stories of Retsuden in that. Um, I started running into characters I know nothing about, and this week it was... What was the guy's name? Shijima Wataru, who, looking up on the Garo Wiki, is um, Baro the F Thunder Knight from Makai Senki. Makai Senki is on my list for this year, so I will know about him in a bit, and that will just leave anyone that shows up from... Yami wo Tarasu Mono that I don't really know anything about. I don't know how long Red Sedan is running, but I'm get, starting to get the impression it's not going to be a full 26-episode series, as um, this episode was actually two side stories in one. The first one being around Wataru Shijima and him hunting down forts of horrors and it's pretty much just a long action scene showing how cool the guy is and how he so easily invades these stories. And actually, I kind of liked um, the first half of it because he was acting as a horror story for the horrors. Except, you know, think of it in reverse terms. A guy runs into a bar and tells a bunch of guys he's, he's he knows about how everyone he... He knew that this other bar they regularly frequent was murdered by this guy who appears from a section of the bar, does these um, usual mannerisms, and proceeds to slaughter them without mercy. In any in a horror story, that would the one who does that would be the villain, and yet you know it's like inverting expectations because the guy is a knight hunting down possessed monsters and it. It actually pretty, 
it, it works pretty well in a funny way, and I recommend checking this one out simply to see that uh, sequence, because a lot of... It's very dynamic in that in how the whole scene flows, and it's very well shot, very well executed, has a bunch has a bunch of funny moments jammed into about 12, 13 episodes, not episodes, minutes, and um, it's, re it's really a good highlight, and contrasts, um, again, Garo and the other running Toku series, in that when they make out an episode to be a fight scene, they focus properly on building the narrative to that fight scene, and don't, don't diverge from it. Especially since, hey, it's shot on a smaller budget than either of the other shows, so when they actually make it about the battle, they... they make it more coherent and cohesive to what they're doing with it. And this is helped by how all of the calmer story stuff is diverted into the other half, the other side story in this episode, which is focused on Mayuri from Makai no Hana um, visiting Anna, a retired Makai priest chef, in order to uh, rejuvenate the energy in a Makai fish that was given to Koga that Raiga has inherited. I think this is supposed to be the Makai fish that um, Rekka gave Koga at the end of Red Requiem, because that's what I figure would be the most narratively coherent from what I've seen of Garo. Then again, this could be something from the Makai Senki era I just haven't seen yet. Either way works. Because it's like, it gets some downtime, um... It could be set during Makai no Hana, it could be set after Makai no Hana, but either way, it's just Mayuri running an errand that has something to do with the Garo cast, and um, the episode with Anna from Makai no Hana I felt was a good character expansion one for Gonza in how we see him out with one of his friends that day, so this feels like you know, good follow-up as we get a bit more to Anna and the um, role she still has as a Makai priest, even though she's retired in helping other other people still actively part of the war, as this fish can become something that helps um, um, Raiga in whatever conflict he finds himself in is it apparently can become a great dragon and again I've not seen Makai Senki or its subsequent movies to know if that actually factors into anything. If this is the problem with this series like I like I said from someone who is still missing two of its major entries from his watch list. I'll at least be reducing down to just Yami wo Tarasumono pretty soon and hey at least um I have Goldstorm to kind of cover some of that, but not all of it. But, um... The problem here with the side story thing is, while it factors into these two characters, it really does... Um, it really doesn't give any new information for elements of the series. I mean, Rekka's from episode one was more, was getting a bit more finality to her story and the role of, uh, not exactly the role of her father, but the role she's chosen herself as a more combat-oriented Makai priest in uh, fighting things, and last week's episode with Amelie and Jinga was informative on how they became such good partners and powerful people by supporting each other before tragedy destroyed their lives. Whereas, this is a fight scene with a supporting character, which was really good, and then a more calmer, somber, somber bit that doesn't seem that essential aside from getting to see two characters that didn't interact, which, admittedly, I like their interaction, but it's not exactly something we needed either. 
Damn, this wasn't the best of weeks. I almost skipped it too, because I'm in the middle of Ultraman Tiga for, well, writing that review, and I'm about a little over halfway into the series that I, I'm trying to finish it by Friday. I'm getting back to it after I post this. And I have issues with this that kind of informs why I don't regularly do Ultraman Knife. And yeah, it's I should get back to that. So I'm going to wrap this up. I'm looking forward to next week as um, they're hopefully getting more exposition on Ghost, that, though I wouldn't be surprised if they didn't because that's how Ghost is going. And back to fill it with Zyodro. Yeah. See ya.